Hey folks, this is Founder Leroon. I'm here with Lady Shell. How you guys doing? Um, Lady Shell, how are you? Lady Shell, push to talk maybe? No, I had the stream going and I was getting double um, echo and I had to turn that off. Hey everybody, I just don't know how to use, how to use uh, Twitch apparently because I didn't even realize that the sound was on. Anyway, uh, welcome to our stream. Today we are doing episode 8 of our Fantasy Grounds Unity A through Z and we will be talking about the Combat Tracker. Uh, which is uh, one of the DM's best friends. So uh, welcome and uh, hope you enjoy. And what's special today or what was special this week, Lady Shell? Well, on the 4th of November, Fantasy Grounds Unity has officially been released. It is no longer a beta program. So, um, you know, there will be continuous updates, but not quite as many as uh, has been in the past. And they have a few projects that were not um, on the original, like whatever <laughs> to agenda. be done. They Agenda, that's a good word, yes. Um, they will be adding the dynamic lighting and they were, are going to be adding something to do with sound. Now I'm not sure how he worded it because I'm not looking at my blog at the time. But he did say that they would be adding something to do with sound. Okay. All right, so we're going to get into this. We're going to talk about the combat tracker. I know there's been a lot of videos that center around combat or the center around tokens and such. There's not a whole lot of videos out there that actually get into the combat tracker in depth. So we're going to try to cover most of it. We'll, we'll probably miss a few things, but for the most part, we're going to go through everything that, that hopefully that you'll need. Now, this applies to the 5th edition rule set. If you use Pathfinder or one of the other rule sets, hopefully this will help a little. Um, I'm not guaranteeing you because some of the settings and some of the uh, layout is different. So I apologize in advance if that's if that's you. Um, nonetheless, we're going to talk about the combat tracker, and this is for the D&D 5e rule set, and the reason we use that all the time, because that's what I'm familiar with. So, anyhow, so when you want to open up the combat tracker or set it up, it's normally on the top right of the interface. So in this case, with this theme that I have, it is these two cross swords. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. This brings up the combat tracker, and normally, as the game master, I will lay that down right about right about where I have it located, and then I will make sure that I leave a little space for the players above that. If you bring the combat tracker all the way up, when your players join, they they'll be underneath it. So you want to leave a little bit of room, maybe like half an inch or an inch, depending on your screen, above it. Okay, so we're going to break this thing down, the anatomy of this. But one of the first things that you should know when you're setting up your campaign is to put your characters and your NPC encounters in the combat tracker first. So if you're getting ready to start a game and you have characters, they need to be in the combat tracker first. So I just pulled over Lady Shells just to help illustrate what you can do with character on here. So when you start your game and you want to test things out and you want to check things out, you want to test your character sheets out, put them on the combat tracker first. Now try to leave the characters on the combat tracker. The reason for this is once they're on there and you have them linked to a map, if you delete them off the combat tracker, it also deletes the, the uh, data from the location and also the round data from the uh, combat tracker so try to make sure that you keep the characters on the combat tracker it is, it's critical when keeping the positioning on the map and keeping uh, track of your rounds and also any expiring effects or anything like that you can mess up your your rest cycle and all kinds of things so be careful when you put your characters on here 
make sure they stay on there. And then once you're ready to use them in a combat or you know, even even if it's non-combat, you can leave them in the combat tracker. But if you have a map, then you'll link them to the map. So you always go from your PCs to your combat tracker, from the combat tracker to the map. And then not to mention, we will go into this more in depth. But if you're doing a campaign, you also want this this character to be on the party sheet. So I'm going to drag her onto the party sheet as well. And this is your overview of the party. So this is one of the first things you do when you set up for a campaign. And now we're going to get into what this stuff does and what it means, at least for this rule set. So Lady Shell, do you have any comments? Um, no, not really. I think it's a pretty pretty good to remember it as a one, two, three um, way of doing things. This is the first thing you want to do is put them on the comment tracker. Second thing you want to do if you're party sheet, and then you can put them on the map. Okay. Or I guess the map and um, and the party sheet could be interchangeable. Correct. So now that you have things or characters and NPCs, um, you will manage them on the combat tracker. So it keeps track of your initiative, your hit points, temporary hit points, wounds, and lots of other things. But we're going to cover what those things are. So first we're going to go into more like the anatomy of the combat tracker. So we told you where it's located. And now we're going to talk about the menu items. So here on the bottom is the menu. It's uh, on the bottom frame. And it says menu. And it says click for combat tracker menu. So when you click that, you'll get a radial menu. There's delete from com from the tracker. You can close the window. You can rest. You can deal with initiative. Or you can delete effects. So those are the main functions of the menu window. Um, on the bottom here, you have your friendlies, your neutral, and your hostile groups. So if you have groups of allies or enemies, or even kind of neutral bystanders, they will potentially be marked as a certain faction. And what this allows you to do is if you grab one of these heads, or it might be a helmet or a dragon or some kind of weird emblem, depending on your theme. You can drag and drop the entire group of friendlies or the entire group of enemies or neutrals at one time on your map. And then you would place them. Instead of individually dragging each character over one at a time, that's what these things do. Is they kind of give you a shortcut to grab a group instead of one, one character at a time. Then you have the rounds uh, window, which keeps track of rounds. You can click on the cell and manually adjust that. Or if you want to go to the next round, you have this little swoosh wheel here. So if I want to advance to the round two for any reason, I can keep doing this and it will advance the rounds. If I made that by mistake, I can go back to one. But just keep in mind that it goofs around with active spells and your... Um, usages on your spells and also uh, your long and short rest. So be careful when you mess around with rounds. All right, so now um, we have this next actor button, which on the DM side of thing, next actor is just the next player or the next NPC. However, on the player side, I believe it is complete turn or turn complete. So when you're done with your turn, out of courtesy for your table and your game master, please make sure you hit this down arrow. If you have a hard time remembering that, you can drag this over and drop it into your hotkeys. And at that point, it should be there along with other shortcuts to help you remind you that you need to pass your turn when you're done. That's a kind of a rookie thing. Even, even people that played for years forget to pass their turn. The next thing is this little flag. This allows you to set which combatant or which uh, NPC or character is selected. So in other words, if I make another copy of, of Hiena 
I can use the slider to select which player is going to be utilized in case I have to backtrack or maybe we skip someone's turn. But this is the actual selector for the person's turn. And normally when you advance the round, that selector will start at the top and work its way down. So I went ahead and reset the round. And I'll just leave these three copies of he in on here for, for prosperity's sake. Now up on the top, you have this eyeball. So what this does is it will hide um, or reveal NPCs that are on your combat tracker. So let me see here. If I go to encounter, and there's something here I called Black Death. Now Black Death is a young dragon and two kobolds that worship it. And it's a black dragon and some kobolds. So if I drag this over, this is an encounter. This will be added to the combat tracker. And by default, they're usually hidden. And if you have the name turned off for the stat block, meaning here it says Cobalt. The non-ID name is Cobalt 2 because that's what it assigned it. But if you're able to unlock this, you can just say lizard-like creature and it will put that there until you're identified and then you can add their, you can basically allow them to be um, identified by their real names or by their true racial title. Now the rest of this stuff is all automated for the combat tracker in most cases. We're going to go into the, why these numbers are the way they are. Uh, we're going to talk about each one of these cells and each one of these little um, icons or tokens over here on the right, what those mean. So I'm hoping that most of you get the idea of what we're trying to do here, and that's showing you what exactly is what in the combat tracker. So in the menu, I'm going to go back to the menu, you have rest, and if you click on that, you have two options, so short rest and long rest. So as a game master or in the flow of the game, this will determine when you use these. So that is up to you as the game master and the players to figure that out. For menu, in initiative, you have a few options. You have roll all initiative. So if you want to be the, the god and you don't want anyone else to roll, you can roll for everybody. Uh, you can roll just for the NPCs if you need to. You can roll just the characters. Or you can clear all the initiatives. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that because right now, all of my NPCs already have their initiative and their hit points, so I'm going to clear that. And now they're all at zero, so nobody starts yet. And then if I hit the menu again, I go back to initiative, I can hit roll all initiatives, it will roll for everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So now this is the new order for round one. And right now, nobody is selected, so I'm going to click here with this little bubble. It's on the far left next to this kobold. That's actually the beginning of round one, and this cobalt is selected. Even though he's not visible, he's selected. So that is something that you should learn about. And if you have to manually change whose turn it is for some reason, you drag this pointer to that person or NPC. You don't use the advance button because that will take you to the next round. If you need to change the order within a round, you move this slider manually so that's something you should know about also in the menu you have delete effects so if somebody has effects like here's an effect that's ongoing for this dragon but if for some reason you had to delete it let's say you cut out his uh something off his face where he didn't have any more glands to produce produce acid so you could take this delete effect and you can clear expiring effects or you can clear all effects. So if anything was going to expire this round or the next turn, you can clear that. Or you can clear all the effects regardless. So if I clear that, it even takes away his uh, immunity to acid. So that's something I'd be careful with, but that's a, a way to, you can clear it kind of like an overall. Uh, generally, though, you'd want to do it one at a time. 
So you have an effects button on the right that you can adjust manually so you don't affect the whole table or the whole list here. So we're going to get into some of these shortly. Uh, Lady Shell, do you have any comments about the the layout or where things are in the uh, combat tracker? Actually, excuse me. Actually, I did have a comment that was somewhat related. Is um, I was wondering when you made those three, those two other copies of my character. Uh -huh. Even if you delete them, does that stay in uh, Unity? Because I know Unity keeps all your characters. No, or I don't is think it, so. Would it delete them if you deleted them off the combat? I, I don't think it, it didn't make additional sheets. So that's if that's what you're asking. No, it doesn't. There's only one of you, yep. but those are just combat tracker copies. I am an original. <laughs> I think that might be handy if you had like mirror image. Or a spell like that, because then that you can make would, a copy of yourself and cool. put you on the map and stuff. I don't know, something like that. Okay, huh, so interesting. So this, uh, the way this is set up is is kind of, you know, it's some of it's intuitive, some of it isn't. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you is for deleting things off the combat tracker. Now to make things simple, and you don't really have to do this, but if you wanted to get rid of everything at once, including the players and everything you wanted, you can change the faction to uh, get it away from a friendly. You can either make it neutral or hostile, and that would be a temporary thing. And you go to menu and you hit the garbage can, and you can hit delete only foes or delete non-friendly, which is neutrals on up to foes. So if I changed all these to non-friendly and I clicked on this delete all non-friendlies would delete all of them. So if I had a mixed bag here, like a neutral and a, maybe another neutral, and then Lady Shell will be a friendly, then what will happen is it'll be selective as to which ones it deletes. So if I delete just the foes, it's only going to delete the dragon because he's the, the menace here. He's the bad guy, the hostile. Okay. Now if I click uh, delete from tracker, and I click all non-friendlies, it should delete the cobalts. And it did. But there's no way to delete all the characters. In most cases, you don't have to worry about that. However, if you're testing something and you want to clear everything out of the combat tracker, just change the party members into one of the other factions and treat them like an NPC, and then you can delete them all. So I'm going to go to NPCs or encounters again. I am re-adding the NPCs, and as you see, they're automatically set to hostile. But if I wanted to basically delete everything off here, I could set all this stuff here, and if I hit menu, and I hit delete from tracker, and I click delete all non-friendlies, that means neutrals and the hostiles will be deleted. So everything would be deleted in this case. So that is how you remove everything at once. That's just a little tip. So the next thing is setting up your encounter. And I'm going to show what you're going to do with the encounter within the combat tracker. So this is not with the map. This is just in the combat tracker. So first of all, when we start our campaign or our one shot, Everybody goes in the combat tracker first. Okay, regardless. If you have NPCs ready to go, hopefully they're already in there. But if not, you're going to take whatever encounters that you've built around the session you're going to work with, and you can put them on ahead of time. And they will not be visible. Not by default. So there, those guys are ready to go. The players, when they connect to the table, the only thing they'll see is their character and their allies. The friendlies and the neutrals are not always visible right off the bat, unless the game master manually turns some of these on or off. And you do that with this eyeball that's next to the the care or the NPCs. 
You can reveal them all at once by clicking on the master where it says show all non NPCs or show all non playing characters. If you do that, it makes them all visible in the combat tracker and the map. So visibility is tied with the map. So if they're visible on the map, they should be visible on the combat tracker and vice versa. So I'm going to go ahead and make them invisible for now. So those are some things that you should know before you set up an encounter. And also when you're running an encounter, that you're not going to panic and say, oh, I don't want them to see them yet. By default, when you drag an encounter in here, they are invisible. And that pertains to non-friendly, which is neutrals, and hostiles. Anything friendly, it usually shows. So if you have more allies or like an animal companion or something like that, if they're set to friendly, they are automatically visible. So if you don't want them to be automatically visible, turn them to neutral until you decide when you want to change them to whatever faction. So there is a threat, and then there's kind of like a non-threat, and then there's friendly. That's basically what that is determined at that point. So you have enemies, allies, and neutrals. All right, so we're going to get into all of these little things up here. Again, I'm going to start on the left. So this is show all NPCs. That's the eyeball. Then you have the name of the NPC or character. You have the initiative role, which is in the cell here. And right now, Hannah doesn't have an initiative role. So I'm going to give her one. But instead of rolling from the menu, I'm going to have it roll from the sheet. So instead of me doing it manually and forcing it on her, I will bring up her character sheet. Her initiative is right here. As a player, I would ask her to drag this initiative down to her hotkeys. That makes it so much easier for her to find this when it comes time to play because she will be spending most of her time on her actions tab. So to keep flipping back and forth during initiative time is kind of a bummer. The other thing that she would do, hopefully, is enable some of these different racial feats. These are things that are traits. These are things that are constant. So she has Dwarven Resilience, so she'd put that on first. And then any other passive abilities that may apply, she would do that as well. In this case, it's just that one. Now she's on Combat and Actions, that's where she wants to be. And when she rolls her initiative, all she has to do is single click on this hotkey. Fantasy Grounds will automat automatically add any uh, bonuses. So she has a 5 plus 1 is 6. So that's her initiative roll. So now she's last in the order. So once that's established, I'm going to click up here, which is combat number 1, or combat number 1. And that's going to basically start the rounds. And the kobolds go first, then the dragon, then Hiena. So that's how the initiative is determined, is by the higher roll. In the, in the case of a tie, you're going to have to figure out, as a game master, who's actually going to get the turn. Normally, I would look at dexterity. Whoever has the highest dex is basically the tiebreaker. My next move would be, if the dexterity is the same, then I would look at the weapon type. If it is a spell... More than likely, depending on the type of spell, you have to look at the description of the spell and see how quickly it can be casted. Unless they're using the quickened uh, meta magic from a sorcerer, I would also consider the weapon type. Usually, the smaller the weapon or the lighter the weapon, that person gets the right away. And the reason for that is the ease of swinging it or throwing it. As a, and the recovery of the weapon, as opposed to other factors. And that's kind of left over from older rule, rule sets and variations. But that's usually how I, how I figure out a tiebreaker. doesn't happen very often, but when it does, you're going to have to kind of figure out how to, how to deal with it. And that's just a suggestion that I gave you. Okay, so now that she's on the combat tracker 
and she has her initiative. That's that's basically what I wanted to show you. Now there are some things that basically influence or change how these things are set up in the combat tracker and these are options in the options window. So I'm going to go ahead and delete again this this uh, combat tracker uh, set up here except for he and I'll leave her on here. But all the NPCs I'm going to delete. So to make that easier instead of right clicking and and trying to delete one at a time I will come down to menu delete from tracker delete only foes and that that gets rid of all the enemies the reason i'm doing that is so that i can show you that you can have these your initiative and your hit points can be randomized for npcs so in the menu option there are a few places that you want to look at one of them is in combat so if you scroll down where it says combat you have your auto NPC initiative is on. So that means that Fantasy Grounds is going to roll, but it's going to have a random roll. If it's on group, then everything in that group is going to have the same exact initiative. So in other words, if I bring over this encounter again, and I drag it, all of them are going to have similar initiatives in a group. So a group in this case would be the two goblins are considered a group and the swamp dragon is a separate group. So the swamp dragon has a four and the kobolds have threes. And if you notice they both have the same hit points. So that can also be changed. The other thing is the number. So you have kobold one, kobold two. So NPC and numbering is append. So if you have more than one creature type, it will be separate. However, if you have five or six kobolds, it will label it one to, to six. If you want that to be different, you'll change it to random. So it fools the party. So now let me see if I can delete that. I'm going to delete from only the foes. Now I'm going to drag over the encounter. And it should randomize the numbering system as to what enemy is which. And I went ahead and changed group as the default. The numbering is is random. The NPC roles variable or fixed. That we'll get into that shortly. But that is also uh, these are the three things that I'm going to talk to you about. So right now we're talking about the random numbering in the combat tracker. So I turned it back to random instead of uh, append. So you can also turn it off, which means that you have to roll manually the initiative for the NPCs. Or if you have it on random, it's just going to roll the number of creatures, but it's not going to give it a set number. So if you see Goblin 1 to 3, you're going to say, okay, it's a party of 3. But if you see Goblin 7 and Goblin 3, and then Goblin 18, you're going to go, crap, there's a whole bunch of goblins, or kobolds, but actually there's only three. So this is kind of throws off the player. So what I'm going to do is drag this over, and we'll see what numbers it assigns to these combatants. Okay, so initiatives are different because they're in different groups, but they've numbered Kobold 1 and Kobold 4. There isn't four kobolds in this encounter, there's two. But it gives the players the false assumption that there are more combatants ready to be um, taken on. So this is kind of a tactic and a tool to use to throw people off from metagaming and such. I kind of like that occasionally. I would use that on a, a more advanced group of, of players. If they were new, probably not. I probably wouldn't worry about it too much. I mean, they're having a hard enough time figuring out their character sheets and stuff, so I don't think I'd be that cruel. The other thing is these NPC roles, fixed or variable. So what this does is it looks at a NPC stat block when it's added to an encounter and added to the combat tracker. Right now it's on variable. 
So whatever attacks they have for damage that do damage are going to have this hit number, which is an average. So for the bite, for example, on this dragon, his average damage is 15. The range is 2d10 plus 4. So that is 24. So if you average those numbers and you round up, you're going to get 15. And that's where that, that hit number comes from. So what that means is when you add that this NPC to the combat tracker, that NPC, regardless of the attack type, they're always going to do that damage. So they'll always do 15, and you'll always do 11 for the claws. So this means that you can predict how many hits it's going to take to knock somebody down on the other side of the fence. So in other words, if you have a low-level party and you want to control how much damage is being done each time, you can fix those, you can change those hit numbers if you really want to, or you can just go by the average, and you'll know it's only going to take two or three hits to knock them down. So it's a way to control the amount of, of, of the combat as opposed to uh, the duration. So you, if you don't want the combat to last forever, or you want to have more control over the combat, then you use this hit number. Sometimes it's more realistic to have the hit number and just every time they punch, it's roughly the same number. And then you know if the NPCs get punched three times that they're going to they're gonna go down or the players are going to go down. So this is a kind of a cool way that you can control the flow of combat if you want to do that. Otherwise, most people leave it as variable, which means that it's going to roll the damage every time and add any bonuses and such. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're playing in your campaigns. So you have your auto initiative NPC. So you have three categories. You have group, which makes everyone go at the same time. You have on, which means it will roll for you, but it will be random. And then you have off, which is basically it will not add any initiative when you add the NPCs to the combat tracker. So if I go ahead and change this, I'm going to delete only the foes. And I'm going to change this the way I normally set it. So the add auto NPC initiative, I usually have it on. So I have random initiatives instead of all the same. Uh, the variable or fix, I have it on variable, so they roll for their damage instead of having a set amount. And then the numbering, depending on the level of the party and how experienced they are, I would probably just leave it on append, unless it's like a high-level group. And that's pretty much what that does to affect your encounter. So if I bring up the um, encounter again and I add it, it will add those changes before i add it though i want to show you one more thing that's affecting here and this is your death saves which means like on your front page as a character when you get three death saves and you get three death um, failure chances if that comes to be if you go unconscious fantasy grounds will automatically roll those for you if you don't like that, you have to tell your game master to turn it off, and then you roll from your sheet. And Fantasy Grounds will determine if you pass or fail. So that is just a matter of how this uh, setting works for, for death and how it handles it. The other thing is hit points. So this is combat tracker hit points. So you can set this to where... The NPCs are always going to have maximum hit points or standard, which is just a, an average, or randomized, which I prefer. So now when I add this character or this NPC encounter, they should all have different things. So I'm going to drag it over. There will be some duplicates, but not as much. Okay, so the Swamp Dragon has 21 on initiative and 139 hit points. So that's a range of numbers there. So he doesn't have his average. Cobalt has 14 initiative, but only five hit points. This Cobalt down here has a three on initiative and one hit point. 
So it gives it a little bit more realistic feel to it instead of all of them going at the same time and all of them having the same hit points and everybody having a number one through 10. So that's the sort of things that you're looking at to change. One other thing that's kind of indirectly related is to roll initiative each round. So you can set that to on, and what that means is every time you reach the top of the round, Fantasy Grounds is automatically going to re-roll the initiative. And those are left over from earlier times. In most cases, you probably don't have to mess with that. But if you want it to roll automatically at the top of each round, it'll do so. The problem with that is some spells, when they start and stop, that messes with the duration of the spell, so be careful with that. Some spells start at the beginning of a turn, some at the end, and if you mess around with that, it may ruin the duration of the spell. So that is just basically the main parts of the options that can be set for adding combatants or NPCs to this combat tracker. So Lady Shell, anything else? Or anything you wanted to ask? I, move I had a question. Yeah, um, you said that that um, roll each round is that for everybody? It's going to automatically yes. roll for everybody. Yes. Even the players. Yes. Oh, okay. I don't like that. Yeah, it's it's left over from when uh, other game systems these used to roll every round. Yeah, that wouldn't be good for like a blessed players. Right. Ten rounds or whatever that it would last, and then when you, you know, change yes. like that, does it start to one again? What does it do to the spell? It, it messes the the actual duration. So if it lasts ten rounds, and you mess around with when the rounds start and stop, you may not get a lot of protection in between the rounds that were skipped, or you know what I'm saying? Like you didn't get through your full turn. And that's what it messes with, is, is the duration of spells and when they start and stop. So maybe you're, if you're playing with a different rule set that doesn't have rules that correct. are similar to that, that it wouldn't matter. Right. And I think second edition is that way. Um, there might be some variation. I know there's an extension out there, there used to be, that helped combat that when you use that option. I think Celestian wrote that, but I don't know if it works still or, or what. But if you're interested in that and you don't want your spells affected, there there might be a um, still be a thing out there in the community that it's an extension that basically keeps track of that for the spells so that the durations and the start and stop times don't get messed with. And you could probably find that on the Fantasy Grounds forums. Correct. Okay, so the next thing is I'm going to talk about these little icons here that's to the right of your status or your faction, this little helmet. So there is a targeting window which allows you to manually target things in the combat tracker or even on a map. So if I drag this little targeting token onto Hiena, it will put her little token here and it tells me that she's targeted. And if you want to clear targets, like if you want to get just get rid of them, you can just click that little button there and it clears all your targets. So even if you do this on the map, it, it records it here still. So this is your targeting view. And then here's your attributes view, which is where you can roll checks from the attributes of an NPC without bringing up their stat block. So I could double click if I needed it to make a charisma check or a wisdom check, whatever it may be, so I don't have to is go that, like, Huh? Is that only for checks, not for saves? Correct. Saves are forced by the characters, remember? Or the spell itself. So when you cast a spell, you are, in effect, making the save for the uh, creature that's affected by it. So when you roll the dice, not always, but ma many times, you're doing a saving throw to see if it passes or fails. So you don't need saves normally, just the checks. Because the players perform the saves for the game master. 
Right, like uh, Sacred Flame has a deck save in it, and yep. the game automatically does the deck save for the character. Yes, when you drag and that you see save. The six, I hate seeing a six on that. Mm. I mean, you usually want to see success, but when you're rolling for the other play, the uh, whatever you're attacking, and it says success, that is not a good thing. No. So basically, you, you got your checks there. The next one is offense. This if in NPC format, this basically has all their weapons or their actions and traits. On a character, however, it just shows their bonuses and if it's a reaction or not. So this is a little different from a PC. There's a lot less info here, but you still have your attributes. You still have you can still say if it's a reaction or not if they've used their reaction and their initiative and their armor class is held here just like this but there's a little bit more data on npcs uh because characters you have your own character sheet so you don't have to have as much data the next thing is the space and reach so you have your size of your creature and then the reach so if you're 10 foot um and considered for like your size on the map and then you have five foot of reach around that. And that's what those are for. And then you have your effects drop down menu. So this is the same for characters and NPCs. So with that, you have all of your effects or the ability to manually type in. So if you wanted to say that this, this creature was prone, he already has immunity to acid, but if he's prone, then I'm just going to type the word prone. And what that you could does... You can also drag it from the plus minus yes. over on the right, right? Yeah, if you have if you have the uh, plus, effects, minus. it's the uh, effects... Yeah, it's the man, not the plus right. minus. So Is if, it? Yeah, no. so if you have that... Yeah, I told the wrong button. Then you would drag that over. And it does the same thing, but it puts it on a separate line, and I, I kind of goofed up here. You want to make a separate line, then type it. So, yeah, so you you can delete them um, correct manually, and you're not deleting two at the same time. Correct. The thing about this is players cannot modify anything that they did not put on themselves. So if an NPC or the GM adds this the GM has to take that off. If the player manually adds something from their character sheet or types it into their area here where it, where the effects are, they themselves can adjust it and remove it. So it's a control for the, for the game. So these effects are common effects that are already hard-coded into Fantasy Grounds. So if you are blinded or your NPCs are blinded, you drag and drop this onto the combat tracker. It gives them the blinded condition that automatically gives them disadvantage on different things, depending on what's being thrown at them. So if they're being attacked, I believe they have disadvantage on saves and such, or or armor class, you know, it's probably negative two or negative five. So it just depends on what the situation is, but all that is hard coded in here. You need anything special you can make your own like these custom ones and if you've uh, played with fifth edition and you have rob 2e's coding effects he has a module that's separate from those and it's called uh, conditions and effects and what it is is a whole bunch of codes that has to deal with things needed for npcs because quite often when you load and play with npcs you will notice that they'll be missing some of their traits on their stat block actions. Some of them will not even be codable, they'll just be notes, but it's nice to have that there. So if you have the Rob Toohey's coding effects, you probably have all the things for the characters, but there is a bundle or a separate module that has conditions and effects, and that adds all of the, or most of the, immunities and, and those sort of things. So in other words, this immunity to acid, if that wasn't on your sheet, which it already is in this case, 
But if it's something like that that's not on your sheet, you could actually drag and drop that custom effect onto your NPC to give them the benefit or the penalty, depending on what it is. So if you have NPCs that are actually like player characters, that's where those custom effects come in handy. Because a lot of NPCs that are players that are basically like a player character, they're never going to have the same amount of automation as your action stab. So you'll be missing a lot of little things like uh, like channel divinity. You may not have that coded on your NPC stat block. So you'll have to create that manually. Or if you get some of Rob's effects, he'll have something made that's similar that all you have to do is adjust it or at drag and drop it onto the NPCs. So the condition and effects module is is a must for a DM. It's one of those things where, you know, if I didn't need it, I wouldn't I wouldn't use it. So I need it when I have. conditions and effects is probably your best bet. Now, not all rule sets have this. So if you are playing with, you know, Pathfinder or something like that, you still have to do it manually. I put the link to the DMs Guild uh, for the conditions and effects in case anybody would like to get that. So here's the module. It's called the 5e condition and effects. It's mainly to be used on NPCs or four NPCs. So for instance, here's an example now, I have all these different effects. I mean, there's tons of them. So let's say that one of your abilities gives you a plus two on attack. So unless you memorize this code, this ATK colon two, to type onto your sheet, you're not gonna, you're not gonna always remember this stuff. So in this case, you can drag this over and it adds it to the sheet automatically. So all these are custom effects that were typed out by hand. And a lot of these mimic or emulate a lot of the actions that you have on your character sheets. Now there'll still be a few that are missing and you'll have to make your own, but for the most part, you have this. So just like exhaustion, for example, that is a, that's a condition, but it's not clearly defined in the conditions and effects. It should be. There's even a spot down here for it, but there are different levels of exhaustion. So these things here are mostly notes, but they're nice to have. So if you have, if Hiena had exhaustion level of one, she has disadvantage on ability checks. So if I wanted to drag and drop that on her, I would, and it would automatically give her disadvantage on whatever it's keyed to. So all of these things are more or less created so that if you have an NPC that is kind of like a character that's helping the party out, or maybe it's a, a, a boss NPC that you want them to have all of the different features that that class would normally come with, this is what you want to get. And these these are editable, so you don't have to stick with it. Like it says vulnerability colon edit. Edit means that you can change whatever this character is vulnerable to or whatever the NPC is vulnerable to. So anyways, those are the conditions and effects that can be applied to the combat tracker. Or if your character has it coded on the sheet, they can do it manually from their sheet and it goes on to the combat tracker. So this combat tracker does a lot of things. It keeps track of effects, conditions, rounds, hit points, even when you're wounded, it keeps track of that. It does a lot of things. And some of the other cool things that I'll explain are, uh, you also have um, where it will keep track of spell duration. So if Hiena casts a spell, let's see, I am going to clear this mess for right now. I'm gonna, I'm done talking about all these different, uh, 
icons up here. So we've covered those for the most part. But I want to give you some just some additional things that you may or may not know. So Hannah right now is a cleric and she has the ability to cast Bless. So I'm going to go ahead and cast Blessed on herself. So let's go with Bless. It's probably up here because it's her, it's one of her domain spells. So there is a, a flag or a little uh, note here that is a two parentheses with a C on it. So what that does is it gives her the tag to be Blessed. So right now, I just click this little Bless effect. It puts the rounds and the fact that she's using bless as a concentration spell. So it, Fantasy Grounds will keep track of that. And then if she casts it on herself as an effect, if she wants to benefit from it, then I have to drag over also the effect itself, which is a 1d4 added to her attack rolls and a 1d4 added to her saving throws. So if I, I drag find that control. funny because that's going to go against the exhaustion. Yeah, well, I'm going to remove the exhaustion. So if I go to effects and I look at exhaustion, I'm going to double click on that and remove it. So the exhaustion's gone now. So we're not going to have that issue. Okay, so now that that's happened and she's playing the game, whenever she rolls an attack roll, she will get a plus four added to her 1d4 from the spell. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of emulate that. So I'd say she's going to do a two-handed, or a, excuse me, a one-handed Warhammer attack against the Black Dragon. So she's going to roll her attack roll. Am I really that stupid to go melee with a dragon? <laughs> well, you missed anyways, but you rolled with advantage for some reason. Oh, because he's prone. That's right. He fell down. <laughs> and then it added the D4, which you rolled a four, but you rolled so low on the on the regular attack that it it dropped a two and it gave you a three. What do you know? Um, and then you ended up with an 11 total with all the bonuses added up. So I that, definitely need different colored dice because I had yeah, a horrible initiative too. Yeah, we're going to change the color of the dice here. So Rather than this purplish color, I think we're going to make it more of a aqua green look. Okay, so now we'll try it again. So we'll, show, we'll say she gets two attacks, even though she really doesn't. Okay, so this time she hit. She got a, a 19 plus a 3. It dropped an 11 and plus 4 or plus 3 for the uh, bless. So that gave her a better chance to hit. And now I'm just going to roll the damage like normal. So here's her Warhammer damage. That, of course, she rolled a 1 on that. She, she did 4 points of damage. So anyhow, she just kind of thumped him on the side, and, and that's it. But uh, if the dragon retaliates now, and she has this effect, so right now she has the Bless uh, moniker or the you know the it shows the duration and that she has blessed and then also the he's got itself. the attack too though that's not fair <laughs> yeah i'm gonna go ahead and remove that so i'm gonna remove the attack too and the prone because he stood up now and i'm going to go to his offense which is basically like running this whole thing out of the combat tracker no map required. So now I'm going to take, and he's going to try to bite her. So he has a plus seven on attack. So, I'm small. You can't get me. Right. So if he makes the attack roll, Fantasy Grounds is automatically going to check, or she takes damage. It's automatically going to roll to see if she maintains the, the bless spell. So I'm going to clear the chat right now so we can see that. Okay, so right now it's the dragon's turn. He's within range. Um, he is going to do a claw, a single bite attack, excuse me. And this is going to be against Hiena. So he rolled an 18. 
that's considered a hit. So now when I roll the damage, it should, in a sense, roll a constitution save to see if she maintains the bless. And there it was. She also had a bonus on her save because she had bless and she was successful. So she was able to maintain concentration on the bless effect, which makes it stay with her. However, had she failed, this effect would be automatically removed from her and anybody else that had that effect applied to them. So that is a cool thing that the combat tracker does to maintain the flow of combat. So it does automatic death saves. It keeps track of rounds. It keeps track of turns. It keeps track of your hit points, your initiative. It even has you tied to your uh, size and your speed and your, well, not so much your speed, but kind of on the map. It has your reach on here, your effects, uh, offense for NPCs. I mean, there's all kinds of, of different things that this this combat tracker is, is really nice for. But I do um, suggest you try to keep everything on the combat tracker if you can. If any of these creatures die and they're not important, such let's say this combat tracker and this one was dead, we could essentially just remove it from the combat tracker and call it good. But if you want to leave like the, the boss or the swamp dragon on the combat tracker in case it's healed or revived or maybe it has a contingency spell, whatever it is, you can leave them on there. But what happens is when you're scrolling through, you're always going to land on that dead creature and it just slows things down. So pick and choose what you leave on the combat tracker. So if this is going to be an important thing later on, then leave it on there. If it's just a bunch of minions and you don't care, take them off. The other thing I wanted to mention was groups of monsters. So consider this encounter that I've made. It has just two swamp kobolds and a dragon. Honestly, I would put the dragon on a separate uh, encounter, and then I'd put all the kobolds on another. Uh, the reason for that is you want to do these things in waves. This isn't too bad because it's just a dragon and two kobolds. However, if you added like 12 kobolds, And you were playing in this game. I'll go ahead and refresh that. So now when you place this on the combat tracker, look what you get. You get this huge scrolling list. And it takes a while. Like when you're going through this, when you're passing turns, I mean, you're going through a bunch of people. And it takes... I don't know, half an hour. So if you're going to be doing a big combat like that, expect this to take a lot longer. What I would do is break this up. I would take the dragon, put it on a separate encounter, and maybe do the kobolds in three waves. So I'd have probably four encounters. One would be for the dragon, and then the other three would be groups of four. That way, when you're um, combating, uh, or when you're actually in the middle of a action here, I would bring in the first wave of goblins the first round, and then the second one, maybe the second round, and then the third would kind of hold off and use their uh, missile weapons, and or, or just kind of circle around to see where they can come in, and then they would come in. So I would be kind of do it in stages instead of a one big whopping group. This is way too much to scroll through. And you, you're kind of limited on space. So even if you stretch this all the way out, you know, you're not going to have a lot of room. So try to make your encounters a little bit smaller if you can, if it makes sense. So I wouldn't have this Black Death, you know, I would make copies of it just by dragging this over. And then this one, I would just delete the goblins or the excuse me in this case they're not goblins they're 
cobalts. So there's the de Black Death. Um, then I would take Black Death off of here and change this to four or maybe five. Here we go. There's five cobalts there. And then the other one. I'll do the same thing. Change that to seven. So that's your 12, 12 combat. So rather than doing all those at once, I would do them in groups like that. So for the menu, I'm going to delete all these from the combat tracker. So only the foes. And also, it kind of bogs down Fantasy Grounds a little bit when you have more than a dozen combatants on the combat tracker. I notice it's a little bit slower to respond. So basically, what you have here is I would probably introduce the five or maybe these seven. So I'd go ahead and drag this encounter into the combat tracker or send it over there. And I would let the characters fight these guys for a couple rounds. And then I would bring these guys in for maybe missile attacks. And then their boss, the dragon, would come out. Instead of having them all just one big mob, because it really slows things down. So try to be a little bit more judicious on how you design your encounters. And the reason I bring that up is because it affects the combat tracker big time. So you want to make sure that you try not to overload the combat tracker because it does get a little laggy and unresponsive when you get too much stuff on there. So any other questions about that? So that pretty much touches on just the the combat tracker stuff. Um, try not to remove your players in the middle of a campaign. So it's probably all right to remove some of your NPCs if they're dead and such, but you want to leave everything where it is when you exit your game. So when I right click and exit the session, I'm gonna leave everything right where it was. And especially if you're in the middle of combat and you wanna go ahead and um, get all those things back to where they were when you come back. The other issue is leveling. So if they're close to leveling your characters, I would wait till before or after. I don't think I would want to level up in the middle of combat. So that's just a suggestion. You can do whatever you want. But anyhow, so this is a basically your Fantasy Grounds Combat Tracker lesson tutorial. Uh, Lady Shell, did you learn anything today? I mean, from your standpoint? Yeah, yeah of okay, course. Great. great. <laughs> I always learn stuff. Anything that stand out that you might want to share? Um, the... The uh, targeting thing, I never used that before. I mean, I know people have mentioned the targeting thing, but um, yeah, I never I never did that myself when I was DMing. Yeah, sometimes, I don't know what happens, but the link is broken, or I don't know exactly, maybe you have the wrong thing selected. But if you ever get in trouble with targeting on the map, try using the combat tracker. Sometimes it gets goofed up. So if you can't do it on the map, using the combat tracker so if this kobold is having a hard time targeting hannah just come over here to the combat tracker and drag that over and it'll it'll put her on as a you know as a target another thing is visibility i think that does affect things as well so if they're not visible and then you're using them on the combat tracker it may change things i don't remember and then you have this little id thing where you can actually um reveal their true names once they're identified so that is the combat tracker in a nutshell i'm sorry we weren't able to go over all the other combat trackers but they are very similar and they do have very very close functionality especially the core roles there are other game systems out there that are different and i apologize if if this if that's you um, but this was kind of an overview, and this kind of gives you a rough idea of the capabilities of Fantasy Grounds. 
we're using fifth edition and that rule set is a lot farther along than most of the other ones. So if you don't have all that functionality, don't worry about it. You may not need it or it may not even be a big deal. So until next week, I think uh, that'll be about it. Lady Shell, do you have any announcements or anything? No, but it isn't next week. It's the 22nd would be our next show. We, okay. we uh, stream every two weeks. Yep. So we'll start deciding what we're going to do for episode nine. I'm thinking the party sheet would be a good. Uh, okay, we'll do that. Go to. So the next uh, next thing we'll cover is the party sheet, which is an important tool, and we'll talk about how it ties into the game and 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 what how to use it and or some suggestions on how to use it. So until uh, next time, um, we'll see you guys around. Bye bye. Thanks for coming. Have a good Sunday. Bye-bye.